Good morning, family. Uh, we are going to continue in our series uh, reading the letter of Ephesians together. Uh, before I give you a title, I do want to give some context. Uh, I am very much in a stage of life where I am just learning from children all of the time. Um, even this morning, we're learning from the bravery uh, of children uh, as we pray for them, uh, and, and it really is a blessing to us. Uh, I have asked permission to and received permission to share this story. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was driving from here after a message, driving with Atticus. And Atticus, kind of just out of the blue, he's thinking deep thoughts as he does. And he shared and exclaimed, there's a lot of bad S's in the Bible. Now, as a parent, when you hear a phrase like that and you imagine a little bit of British inflection and you mishear what was just said, <laughs> you wonder what they're learning in Second Mile Kids. <laughs> he then proceeded to say, and I said, excuse me? He proceeded to say, you know, Saul, Satan, Saul, you know, before he was like Paul, Bad S's. Like, oh, okay. Relief as a parent. <laughs> this morning's title is Submission, a Bad S of the Bible. <laughs> so there's a lot of bad S's in the Bible. Uh, that title is going to be on the website for a long time, so we won't put the other way in there. All right. So. Let's read Ephesians, but just know what you're going into as we get to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 15. We're going to go all the way through to 6, 9. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to, be su are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. 
Again, it's like bad S's all over the place. Last week we were talking about sin, now we're talking about submission. We're talking about slavery to a degree. There's a lot here. I do want to give some caveats then as, as we go into this. Uh, first off, uh, we are, because we're talking about 45 minutes, not going to be hitting everything in here deeply. There's not time for that. Um, for some of you, some of what's going to be said is going to be going too far. And in, for others, it might be not far enough. And just know that as pastors, we want to continue having conversations with you to, to rightly understand what God uh, desires uh, for us, what he desires uh, us to reflect that is in his own heart. Um, and so in that, just recognize there is so much that is going on here. But just as I completely misheard and miss the point in my own son, as the American church, we have basically missed the point of this passage. And so my desire as a pastor this morning is really to make sure and to underline the point, to make sure that we do not miss the point, that we don't walk away from the point and get caught up in nuances and details when what God wants us to really understand is the point. You're like, what's the point? We'll get there. Before we do, I want to give you some context. Um, when we start talking about submission, there are a lot of layers that are being given to us before we even get to this sort of extended treatment of submission. Last week, we talked about how God is contrasting for us, Paul is contrasting for us the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness and how we have been brought out of that darkness and into his marvelous kingdom of light. And as a result, we no longer live in the former way of living in darkness, but fully aware we live in light in a very contrasting walk in a completely different way than we did before. So in the light, Paul then says, pay attention to how you walk in these dark ways, in these dark days. Look around. Now that you have the Spirit, now that you have enlightened eyes, now that you can see because light is being shone around us and in us, look around and pay attention and see what good can be done and how to walk wisely. Another piece of context is that in the light, we're instructed to be filled with the Spirit. This like, this is the thrust of where Paul is. Already he's talked about in Ephesians, 1, in Ephesians 1, talking about all of the blessings that are coming to his children through Christ, the inheritance, his own power, the resurrection power that will raise us from the dead. All of that blessing in every, in Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place is given to us. And now we pray, God, would you open our eyes so that we can see the magnitude, the extent, the richness of that grace. And then further on in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about how we are loving one another and caring for one another and speaking truth to one another so that we will build one another up and grow into maturity. And maturity looks like the full stature of Jesus Christ. We, through the Spirit, are loving one another so that we will grow up into looking just like Jesus, living just like Jesus, speaking just like Jesus. And, and in the diversity of that, Chad spoke to us about the oneness and the fullness of God and how all of history and everything that God is doing is, is designed to make us one in community and in unity with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we're loving one another as part of the enabling of that, of that happening. So in light, be filled by the Spirit is carrying that thought through and giving us context. We want to be filled as a temple full of the Holy Spirit, completely influenced by the Spirit. 
And that word, that phrasing filled by the Spirit, so easily becomes this mystical idea to us. But Paul gives us great clarity here. He gives us five participles, five phrases that describe, do you want to know what being filled by the Spirit looks like? Do you want to know how to experience the filling of the Spirit? Here it is, speaking, singing, making music, giving thanks, submitting to one another. That's what filled by the Spirit looks like. A few weeks ago, we talked about singing and all that singing is doing when we participate in that gift, that we're instructing each other and we're encouraging each other and we're loving each other through song. We've talked multiple times as a church. Kyle spoke to us about gratitude, the power of giving thanks, the gift that it is to be able to respond constantly, aware with enlightened eyes of all the gifts that God has given us and continually being in a flow of saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. As an exhibition, a demonstration of what being filled with the Spirit looks like. What we're and why we're then focused on submission is really because we haven't spent recently time here, but it is absolutely as necessary as singing. It's as necessary as giving thanks. It is a part of what does being filled by the Spirit look like. It looks like submitting to one another. Paul then is going to spend essentially a chapter's worth of language on that concept. And that's why we are this morning focused in on that. So taking all of those themes, all of those layers, all of that context, that brings us to the point, the passage that we are in this morning is going to encourage us to place others above ourselves. Paul is going to emphasize mutual submission of all believers to one another. And if the question is why, Paul gives us the answer, reverence for Christ. Jesus himself is the measure, the example, the fullness of what submission looks like in its purest, best, most beautiful form it is the life of Jesus. And in awe of him, in reverence to who Jesus is, we submit to one another. We're motivated to submit to one another because of Jesus and our reverence to him. So the point succinctly stated, we're going to repeat this multiple times, but here it is. Every believer is obligated to extend submission to the other out of reverence for Christ as part of being filled with the Holy Spirit. No exceptions. Jesus is our example. Let me restate that, and then we will, we will examine how this text communicates that. Every believer is obligated to extend submission to the other out of reverence for Christ as part of being filled with the Holy Spirit, no exceptions, Jesus is our example. All the other words in the passages that we read this morning is just elaborating and giving us case studies as to what that actually looks like on a practical basis. But that's the point. That is the grammar and all of the language is highlighting it without, uh, there's no disagreement there in terms of what this passage is saying. What does submission mean? Submission can be defined in this way according to Holman Bible Dictionary. Submission is voluntary placement of oneself under the authority and leadership of another. The word submit generally indicates and implies subordination in some degree. It refers to organizing oneself under someone else's power, authority, leadership. That's what submission means. We can't kind of twist it and, and make it sound softer than it is. It really comes at us as like that really sounds hard. And, and that's what the word means. Uh, Nijay Gupta gives us some clarity and clarification there. It says there is a sense of respect that comes with this verb. 
and also compliance, but it is not exactly the same thing as obedience. It's a voluntary, according to one's own conscience, submission under somebody else's authority. It is not subjugation. And that's criti a critical clarifier. So, so when we get to past this, be filled by the Spirit, and be filled by the Spirit, that looks like these different ways, submitting to one another in reverence to Christ, we then ask naturally, well, what does that look like? How does the cross, how does the gospel, how does Jesus' life, how does all of the inheritance that is coming to us in that spiritual blessing apply, in Paul's case, to the household standards of his day? How does imitating, we talked last week about our, our, that it, we are encouraged and commanded to imitate God. How does our imitation of a Lord who transforms human authority speak to the prevailing cultural worldview? I'm going to speak briefly about Paul's, and, and I, I'll give you one more caveat. I'm staying pretty closely to my notes because I want to be precise. There has been so much misconstruing and misunderstanding and twisting of this passage that has led to terrible cultural things that are completely removed from what God desires from the kingdom that, that I'm, I'm sticking pretty closely to this. So, so bear with me if my head is down reading words. We're going to be looking at Paul's culture, Paul's world, uh, to better understand uh, what he is speaking to. Um, and then we're going to pull back and understand, okay, what are the observations, the implications for our culture, for our time? What does submission look like now? So the, the social framework of, of Greco-Roman culture, household codes, really are organized in the way that you see it here. Husbands, wives, parents, children, masters, slaves. That was how the ancient world had a framework for how society was organized. To think outside of that structure was to, in their minds, invite social chaos. There, there, was, no, there was no other way of imagining the world outside of that construct. And that construct, uh, many commentators speak to how it speaks to the full spectrum of what it means to be human, whether it is humans as sexual beings, male and female, whether it is humans as historical beings that have a past, who have parents that we didn't choose, or, and have children whose lives and, and destiny we're not directly determining, we're historical, and to a degree we're economic, or we are, uh, what was the wording there, uh, material beings. So in some way, shape, or form, we are being shaped by economic forces and structures in our life. And that was exactly how they were viewing the, the world. So then what are the social implications of the kingdom of light and this Lord and this cross and this gospel on that structure? The word submission in that structure and in that world was commonly used. Highly stratified, hierarchical society, that word shows up often describing how a subordinate in that society should honor and defer to the superordinate, the, the one who was in privilege and in power. That was the grease that ran society. That was how that society was organized. So Everything that we think about society, individualism, freedom, equality of human nature, even at like an ontological how we were born level, was completely different from how the world was viewed then. This passage needs to be read with Paul's own world in mind and his culture in mind and, how, and his imagination and scope of the world. So that meant if you're a wife, in a formally patriarchal society, this is what it meant. You were legally treated as minors, 
considered ontologically inferior, generally considered weak-willed, less intelligent, emotionally volatile. It's a different world, but that is how women were viewed, generally speaking. If you're a slave, you are in an economic system that assumes that you are property and non-persons incapable of reasoning. You can be reasoned to, but you cannot offer reasoning yourself, and you have no rights of inheritance, you have no rights for marriage, and therefore, I mean, you can already imagine how this letter is hitting the slaves in the Ephesian church and how they're hearing co heirs inheritance, and that language, and then they're wondering, okay, what further implications might there be here? If you are a child, you had no rights, you were to be seen, not heard. That was your legal basis. And so Paul is going to speak into this clear structure, this cultural worldview, and say, okay, how does the gospel and the kingdom of light apply and challenge and change and transform this model of thinking? And for us, that makes it difficult because we're trying to understand, okay, where is Paul describing a world and where is he prescribing and giving universal principles that are to be applied to all cultures at all times. And we're trying to discern that here, and we don't want to miss the point. The reality is, this passage, we're not really going to talk about slavery this morning. But slavery is abhorrent. There is not, no room for the concept of owning another person. And that breeds a whole range of questions as to why aren't the New Testament writers speaking to abolition in no uncertain terms. If you want to talk about that, I would like to talk.